Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he declares that Jesus holds everything together, from the majestic to the microscopic and everything in between, work and family, friendships and faith. In this series, Pastor Skip explores the practical application of Jesus' preeminence so we can make sure that Jesus is at the center of it all. Always only Jesus, Welcome to church. Even though things are a little bit different than you're used to, we did move things around. Some people go, they took my seat. What'd they do with my seat? So that's always fun to watch that. And then uh, we want to welcome you who are online joining us, Calvary Church at home. Please feel welcome. We have a great team. We're developing that team to communicate uh, to you no matter where you are joining us from. Also, we want to say a special hello to our Santa Fe campus and our Westside campus. We love you. We know you're there and we thank God for you. So turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, listen, as you are getting ready for this weekend study, let me just remind you that like every family, uh, meal times are pretty sacred, right? When you're a family, one of the best things you can do as a family to unify that family is to make sure that the family gets together regularly over a meal, same space, same place, same time, same food, and they interact. Likewise, we believe one of the healthiest unifiers for any church is to feast on God's Word together. We like to do that on the weekends, but we like to go deeper during the week, and our real family meal time of digging deep is Wednesdays, and we've had a great beginning to first or Second Samuel, the book of Second Samuel in the Old Testament this last week. We invite you out again Wednesday for that. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 15 in just a minute, but let me begin with the true story. This happened to me. I had rented a car. I was returning it to the airport uh, in Atlanta, Hertz, rent a car. I pulled in, got out, gave my papers to the Hertz attendant, and she um, looked at me right in the eyes, and she said, you were speeding. I said, pardon me? She goes, you were speeding. She said, the police called. They have photographed you getting on the on-ramp on Interstate 85 South, and there is a fine you have to pay, and you have to pay inside $295. She said, you have to pay inside or you will be retained. That's what she told me. Pay or you will be retained. And I'm, I'm shocked. And just as shock comes over my face, she looks at me and smiles real big and goes, just kidding. <laughs> So here I was, believing this new revelation, it was starting to sink in, only to, to find out she concocted the whole story. That is the predicament that the Colossian church happens to be in. False teachers have come into their assembly and they have concocted a story about Jesus that is fake news. It is not real, but some people it's starting to sink in and some people are starting to believe false teachings about who Jesus is. Now you've heard me tell you this before, but there was a family that was going on vacation and uh, there was a thief that was watching across the street to find out when they were leaving. And as soon as they left and went on vacation, in the middle of the night when it was dark, the thief came and picked the lock, opened the kitchen door, it was dark inside, and is snooping around with a flashlight and hears a voice. And the voice says, I see you, and Jesus sees you. It's like, Whoa, that's weird. So he shines his flashlight to find out what's going on. 
can't find anybody. He keeps snooping around. Here's the voice again. I see you, and Jesus sees you. Boy, this is so weird, but he couldn't locate the voice. Finally, after the third round of that, he shines his flashlight across the kitchen on the counter is a parrot in a cage. And so he just sighs and smiles like, this is no big deal. Turns on the kitchen light, and down by the counter on the floor is a Doberman pincher, glistening teeth in a crouching position. And before the thief can say anything, the parrot says, attack, Jesus, attack. (laughs) This illustrates a problem. Which... Jesus, do you follow? You say, I follow Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Really? Which one? You go, what do you mean, which one? Are there more than one? Well, according to Paul the Apostle, there are. He wrote to the Corinthian church and said, if somebody comes and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus that we preached to you, you might put up with it. So apparently, people concoct stories that are false, but they use the same terminology, Jesus. A lot of people have different Jesus. Uh, There's the benign, let anything happen, be tolerant of everybody, pat little kids on the head, and smile, Jesus. Then there's the good teacher, nice guy, but certainly not God, Jesus. Then other people have the attack Jesus. They're mad at everybody and everything, and it's always only judgment for them. So which Jesus? Now, I'll remind you of our very first study, and when I told you that in Colossae, there was a belief system already at play. We call it the Colossian heresy. And the teaching was a mix between Greek mysticism and Jewish legalism. And this developed by the second century. It became known as Gnosticism. It wasn't known as that yet. But eventually it was known as that, and this is the beginning of it. And the idea of Gnosticism is gnosis means knowledge. These people claimed to know more than everybody else. They had a spiritual inside track to get in touch with God. So they believe basically that God is good, but the material world is evil, therefore a good God could not have created an evil world. So he didn't create it, they say. What they say is emanations went out, sub-gods went out, other beings went out created by God, and one went out so far from God that that emanation didn't even know God, and that is the one that created the material world. They also stated that Jesus himself was one of those emanations, and that he did not have a physical body. He was a phantom, because he couldn't have a physical body. If he's a good emanation, he can't have anything from the physical material world. So this group of false teachers denied the deity of Jesus Christ and the humanity of Jesus Christ all at the same time. So Paul writes this book, and Paul's answer to all that begins now. In verse 15, after a polite introduction, grace and peace to you, saints, faithful brethren, after stating that I'm thanking God that your faith is vibrant. You heard the gospel. You believe the gospel. It is evidenced by your love. You have hope in the future. You are replicating yourself and bearing fruit and then giving a short little list of what he is praying for for them, that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, etc. Now, Paul gets down to brass tacks. He basically says in the verse we are about to read, looky here, false teachers, here's what you need to know about Jesus. He is supreme. He is supreme. There is no higher. He's not some second-rate emanation. He is supreme. He's supreme in relation to creation. He is supreme in relation to 
the church. Verse 15, he, Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. The supreme message of this book, the Bible, the supreme message is Jesus Christ. How many of you know that when you hold your Bible, the, the greatest message, the overarching message of this book is simply stated, it is Jesus Christ. So when you start reading Genesis and you get the creation of mankind, then you have the fall of man, you immediately have a prediction that the seed of the woman is going to come and destroy the head of the serpent one day. It's the first prediction. And then you keep reading the story and it unfolds. You get into the historical books that tell you about the longing for the Messiah, the looking for the Messiah. And the prophets then predict what he will do, what he will be like, what to expect. And then we get to the New Testament and he comes, he shows up, he appears. And there are four books that the New Testament begins with that tell his story who he was, what he said, where he went, what he did. And then we get to the book of Acts, and the book of Acts says that people took the message of Jesus to different places in the world and communities of faith developed all over the place. And then we get to the epistles, and the epistles are essentially instruction manuals for those local churches to govern their worship activity until we finally get to the book of Revelation, which says that same Jesus is coming back to rule and reign over the earth that he created. So this is why Jesus, when he rose from the dead, met up with those two guys on the road to Emmaus and could do this. He could do this. It says in Luke 24, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. Because he is the supreme message of this book, Old and New Testament. What I want to do is share with you out of these verses uh, five reasons why Jesus Christ is supreme. Five reasons why He is supreme. First, He is supreme because He is the revealer of the Father, the perfect revealer of the Father. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, that's Paul's opening line. Here's Paul saying, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the only one who makes visible he who is invisible. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Nobody has seen the Father. God dwells in unapproachable light, the Bible says. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God. But the only begotten Son, who is at the Father's side, literally in Greek, the only begotten God, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known, revealed Him. When I used to do photography way back in the day, we had a thing called film. I know that people haven't heard of that for a long time, but there's a thing you put in a camera called film, and the film had to be in the dark, and when you would expose it to light, it produced an invisible thing called a latent image. The latent image uh, was then put in a tank. The film was put in a tank. You add developer and fixer and stop bath, uh, stop bath and fixer, and you can then see what was invisible on that film. And especially if you do the paperwork and you have an enlarger, uh, you, you watch that image that you couldn't see before come to life right in front of you by the developer. Jesus Christ is the developed picture of God the Father. Didn't he say that in John 14? He who has seen me, finish the verse, 
has seen the Father. Remember that? He who has seen me has seen the Father. God never communicated more clearly who he is than in the person of Jesus Christ. So Paul calls him the image of the invisible God. The word image here is the word icon. Icon is where we get our word icon. It means a a copy or a likeness. A better translation, he is the exact representation or perfect portrait of the Father. Now, real quickly, you have a Bible with you? Do you have a Bible? Show me. Prove it. Prove it. Okay, good. I love that. Thank you. I love when you do that. Turn your Bibles to, to, um, to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. It's, Hebrews is going to help us out a little bit. Not that Paul needs much help in Colossians, but look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. Other translations do it a better justice. Being the exact representation of His being. Thank you, Hebrews. Thank you for giving us that little extra tidbit of help and information uh, to show us what Colossians 1 means. Everything God wants to say about Himself, He said in the person of Jesus. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you ever wonder, what is God like? Here's the answer. Look at Jesus. Uh, You know, is God really loving? How do I know God is really loving? Look at Jesus. That's your answer. Watch him deal with the woman caught in adultery who was about to be stoned by those men. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You're seeing God wanting to forgive people. If you ever wonder, will God really judge the world? I don't know if I'm into that judgment thing. Look at Jesus. He's your answer. Didn't he walk into the temple twice and take the tables of the money changers and overturn them and take a whip and drive people out? There's your answer. What God wanted to communicate about Himself, He communicates perfectly in His Son, Jesus Christ. So He is the image, notice that, not an image. He is the image, no second-rate emanation. He's the exact representation of God in human flesh. God has no other son. There is no other plan. There is no other way to get to God, only Jesus. Say that. Only Jesus. Always only Jesus. So He is the image, the icon, the exact representation. And then Paul calls Him, and this sounds weird to us, the firstborn over all creation. Every cult on earth butchers this verse. And the Jehovah Witnesses are notorious for doing this. Um, They like to use this verse to say that Jesus is not eternal, that He was created first, that God created Him first, and then God used Him to create everything else. That is not what the verse says. He's the firstborn. What does that mean? How many here are firstborn children? Anybody? Any firstborns? Okay, so go ahead, keep your hands up so we know who you are, okay? So you're firstborns. I'm not. I put my hand up. Um, I'm fourthborn. But because you're firstborn, you have a certain kind of privilege and responsibility that comes with being firstborn. But firstborn kids, at least this is how it was in my house, they got more. Um, I know in our day and age, everybody tries to be equitable, but I'm the fourth kid, so I got hand-me-downs. I lived off of shirts that three other boys wore first with all their B.O. and everything else (laughs) for years of my life. Firstborn children don't have to do that because they come first. So if you're in Starbucks and you're ordering coffee, you get to the front of the line, you're about to order, and somebody walks through the door of Starbucks and cuts in front of you to order. Are you okay with that? No, you have a problem with that because you were there first. You were there first. So Jesus 
was there first, but in ancient times, the idea of firstborn was even more important than it is now. Firstborn children in ancient days had status, power, privilege, and got way more than anybody else, usually twice as much as every other child. But over the centuries, this term firstborn came to mean not actually born first, but most important. So just like we have a saying, if I were to say, uh, Abraham is the father of all those who believe. Is he literally the father of everybody who would believe uh, in the future? Did he actually, was he the physical father? of? No, it's just a saying. Or if we say, if I were to say, my wife Lenya is the mother of love and compassion for all dogs. She's, I mean, there's people who love their dogs, but she's the mother of dog lovers. You know what I mean by that. She didn't really give birth to everyone who loves dogs. It's a saying. Firstborn became a statement that meant supremacy, not chronology. And that's in the Bible. Here's an example. Joseph had two sons. Their name was Manasseh. He was firstborn. And Ephraim, he was secondborn. Yet we get to Jeremiah chapter 31, and God says, because I am Israel's father, Ephraim is my firstborn. And we might say, excuse me, God, you, you messed up. Ephraim was secondborn. God says, I'm making him firstborn. I'm placing him in a position of being supreme. He gets the firstborn position. Also, God uses the term to speak of the entire nation of Israel. In Exodus, he says, Israel is my firstborn. Didn't mean they, they were the first nation. There were other nations, many other nations before the nation of Israel. So it's not first in chronology. It's first in supremacy. So it's a matter of privilege and rank. Now, as, as time went on, and it's already happening in Colossae, but it, as time went on through the decades and years and centuries, this denial of who Jesus was sort of reached fever pitch around 325 A.D. when a guy named Arius from Libya, northern Africa, who was a heretic, uh, he denied that Jesus was eternal, denied that Jesus was God, and was all into this type of stuff. So the church convened at a council called the Council of Nicaea. Some of you have heard of that. 325 A.D. in Nicaea, they met to counteract that heresy. And this is 1,700 years ago. The church is already dealing with this stuff. Uh, they had to put out this statement. We believe... In one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one substance with the Father. That's very careful technical language 1,700 years ago. They wanted to codify for the church going forward who we believe Jesus Christ is. And they would draw off of what we're reading in Colossians 1. So number one, Jesus is supreme because he is the revealer of the Father. Number two, he is the creator of the world. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. There's a lot in that verse. Won't be able to get to it all. All things were created through him and for him. Three times in this section, Paul mentions creation and that Jesus is the originator of that creation, all of creation in its enormity. Sometimes we think, you know, we're big and we're important and it's all about us and um, it really helps from time to time if you just get really into yourself and self-absorbed for you to just to, especially at night, walk outside and look up. You don't even need a telescope, just look up and just kind of realize where you are and what you're looking at. 
Now, that's big. That's big. Um, any of you remember the Dr. Seuss book, Horton Hears a Who? So Horton Hears a Who. Horton Hears a Who was a book put out by Dr. Seuss in 1954 and then made into a movie in 2008. And the premise is Horton the Elephant has this little flower and on the flower is a speck of dust and one day on the speck of dust he hears a tiny little voice yelling out to him. And he discovers that on a speck of dust is a whole civilization that didn't even know that there's another being looking over and superintending this. That's us, on the speck of dust. So, we think our world is big. We live on the earth, which is 96 million miles, 93 million miles away from the sun. The sun is pretty massive. Um, it is 109 times the diameter of the earth, and the sun, if you hollowed it out, if you could do that, could hold 1.39 million earths inside of it. Now, that's pretty big. But then there's another star, a little bit bigger than that, it's not even the biggest one, called Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion. It can hold 600 trillion earths inside of it, and 446,000 suns inside of it. And that's just two stars in our little galaxy of about 100 or 100,000 million stars. And then beyond that, the Hubble telescope has discovered that you have to count hundreds of billions of other galaxies. Hundreds of billions of other galaxies. They were all created, all things created by Jesus. I don't know where you stand on creation. I don't know if you want to argue about when it happened and how it happened. And what. Go ahead and do that. But we can all agree that the originator of it all was the Lord Jesus Christ. He created all things. Now, I've discovered that people turn off to the gospel often right here when you mention creation. Because for most people living today, schooled in the secular society, the idea of Darwinian evolution is a done deal. It's, it's fact. It's science to them. And so we are taught that in school. Um, I am a creationist. I grew up in California public schools being taught evolution. I did my own research. I came to, to uh, believe pretty early on in my Christian walk that that isn't what it's cracked up to be. There's so many holes in the theory of evolution. It's still a theory. And I am a creationist. What's more, I believe that the earth was created by Jesus Christ in six literal days. So I just want to throw that out there. If you think, well, what do you mean? I mean, six literal days. Not, not 60 million years, but in six literal days. That's what I believe. In fact, I, I don't even believe that uh, it was like hard work on those six days. I think he kind of had it all done before breakfast with his feet up, kicking back like, oh, that was fun. Tomorrow will be even better. I mean, it was that easy. He just spoke it into existence. Now, I've also discovered that many of the greatest scientific minds, biologists, biochemists, researchers, have raised objections when it comes to evolution, let me throw up something on the uh, uh, screen here from uh, Michael Denton, who is a molecular biologist from Australia, who said, and I quote, G'day, mate. No, he didn't say that. Well, he probably did, but not here. He said, evolutionary theory is still, as it was in Darwin's time, a highly speculative hypothesis entirely without direct factual support as some of its more aggressive advocates would have us believe. What, what Denton shows, and many have shown this, is that Charles Darwin himself knew that he had a problem. The problem was in the fossil record. And he believed that in the study of paleont paleontology, the fossil record, eventually, he, he didn't have the evidence when he proposed what he proposed, but he believed eventually enough time would pass that would vindicate him. 
And what has happened is, as time has passed, it hasn't vindicated him. Actually, the evidence is against him. This is from David Ropp, the curator of the Field Museum of, the natural, of natural History in Chicago, Illinois. He said, and I quote, We are now about 120 years after Darwin, and the knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. We have fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. Which begs the question, if that is true, why aren't they telling us that? If that is true, why do so many smart people believe in it? Well, one of the reasons, I think, is because they think you have to believe in it to be smart. And if you doubt evolution, you then have to be open to the alternative, which is creationism, and that means accountability to whoever did it. And so I really truly believe that there is, in the scientific community, I think a lot of them are guilty of Romans 1. Suppressing the truth of God in unrighteousness. So Paul is saying, here's Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. He, he reveals God the Father perfectly. Perfect image of God the Father. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. Oh, and by the way, Jesus himself is the creator. John 1 even says that he created all things, as Paul does here. Third reason Jesus is supreme. He is the sustainer of the universe. Look at verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Okay, let's take the first part. He's before all things. That means he's eternal. That means he pre-existed. So go back as far as you want to go back. Go back 6,000 years. That's when some of you believe the earth was made, or 10,000 years. Others may think, no, I think it's a few million. Others will say, oh, no, it's 14 billion, and the number of changes. Go back as far as you want and put your peg down, and Jesus will come out of eternity to meet you there. Because he preexisted. He is eternal. Jesus is the only person who ever lived before he was born. I just want you to think about that for a moment. Jesus was the only person who ever lived before he was born. Remember, he's talking to the Pharisees, and, and uh, they're arguing with him, and Jesus is just sort of like not backing down. And, uh, and uh, so Jesus said, well, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And they said, Abraham, you're not even 50 years old. And you, you've seen Abraham? Remember what Jesus said? Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And you know what they did? They picked up stones to kill him because they thought that's blasphemy. You know what? It was blasphemy if he wasn't telling the truth. If he wasn't telling the truth, if he didn't pre-exist then he should be stoned. Paul said he did pre-exist. He is before all things. Before Abraham was, I am. When John writes, and John was with Jesus three and a half years, in 1 John, he said, the one who existed from the beginning is the one that we have heard and seen with our eyes and our hands have handled the word of life. He said in the gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. That's the literal rendering. So never was there nothing, but once there was only one. And that was Jesus, and He began it all. He started it all. The universe had a beginning. It will have an ending. You know, for years, um, decades ago, and then centuries. The prevailing cosmology was called the steady state theory. The steady state theory, also called uniformitarianism. 
and that is that they believe the, the universe was eternal, didn't have a beginning, didn't have, will never have an end, it's just, it's just going on and on and on. Well, we, we know that's not true, and there's so much evidence that says that's not true, so here's an example. Um, our sun, um, the radiation that comes from the sun that benefits the earth is produced by loss. Radiation is produced by the loss. That is, the sun loses part of its mass every single second. So every second, one, two, three, I don't know if I'm being accurate, four, five. (laughs) Every second, the sun loses 4,200,000 tons of mass every second. Every second, it's losing it, losing it, losing it. It recovers one two hundredth of it. So it doesn't recover much of it. What that means is, one day, the sun is going to burn out. Lights out. No more sun. That's going to happen one day. Just like I mentioned Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse today is about a third of its brightness. They're already making predictions when we're going to see its demise. So the sun one day is going to burn out. If the sun had, will have an ending, it must mean the sun had a beginning. So it's not the steady state theory. There was a point in time when everything began, and at that point in time, Jesus Christ existed and was before all things, and he set it into motion. Now, let me get to the heart of this verse. So he is before all things as the creator, and in him... All things consist. Better translation. All things cohere, stick together. All things are held together. So think of how big the universe is and the Milky Way galaxy and the constellations and the billions and hundreds of billions of other galaxies. And God is just perfectly, Jesus is perfectly choreographing everything. And he's holding it all together. Jesus created the universe. He took chaos, unformed mass, and made cosmos, an ordered system, and then he holds it together. Now, one thing we know about all matter is that matter is made up of rapidly moving particles of opposite charges, right? We learned that early on in science. Rapidly moving particles of opposite charges. Carl Darrow, who was a physicist at Bell Laboratory, speaking of the physical nature of the atom, said this. You grasp what this implies? It implies that all the mass of nuclei have no right to be alive at all. Indeed, they should have never been created. And if created, they should have blown up instantly, yet here they all are. Now get this, some inflexible inhibition is holding them relentlessly together. The nature of the inhibition is also a secret, one thus far reserved by nature for herself. I know the secret. It's no secret to us. We know who's holding it all together. He is before all things, and in Him all things cohere, are held together. So what happens if one day He decides to do this? What happens? It's over. It lights out. It's over. Curtains at that moment. Everything implodes. And one day he will. One day we'll all collapse. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 3. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. If you want to know when that's going to happen, read the end of the book of Revelation where he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. 
The created order, the created universe gets uncreated by the creator who is Jesus Christ. He holds it all together, and one day he'll let it all go. And when he does, and not until, it's over. But until then, it's together. Now, if he does this with Betelgeuse and the sun and galaxies, hundreds of billions of galaxies, if he does that, if he holds it all together, don't you think he can hold you together? I mean, really? I, I, I get you have a problem. I understand that cancer is pretty big or that stroke is pretty hefty, but this is God we're dealing with here. He holds all things together, and he has promised to hold your life together. So, you know, you know we like to say to people, and if they're kind of losing it, we say, hold yourself together. But better yet, let him hold you together. Let him hold your life together, and he will. He is the sustainer of the universe. So he's the revealer of the Father, the creator of the world, the sustainer of the universe. Number four, he is the director of the church, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he should have the preeminence. All in favor of Jesus being the head of the church? Yeah, we don't even need to vote for that. We don't even have to have a board meeting for that. He's the head, means he's the source, the, just like in a human body. The head controls the, the breathing, the moving, the uh, feeling, the uh, eating. Um, every part is controlled by the head. He is the head. It says the beginning. It means the originator. He's the beginning, the originator. In other words, the church was his idea. It's not like Jesus said, well, I'm the Messiah, and now I'm leaving, and then they got together and said, gosh, what, what should we do now? I don't know. Let's organize it. We'll call it a church. No, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So it, he came up with the idea, and he's doing a pretty good job uh, building his church around the world. Then it says, let's just kind of quickly finish this up. There's that word again, the firstborn from the dead. Now, this is why firstborn doesn't mean the very first, because there were other people that rose from the dead before Jesus rose from the dead. Lazarus rose from the dead before Jesus did. The boy of the widow of Nain got raised from the dead before Jesus did. In the Old Testament, three people got raised from the dead way before Jesus did. But he says he is the firstborn. There's that word again, prototokos, first in supremacy, or the most important one to ever rise from the dead. You know why he's the most important one to rise from the dead? Because only his death and resurrection gives life. Only his death and resurrection gives salvation. All those other people got raised and died again. There was no efficacy at all in their death and resurrection. So he is the firstborn over all creation. He is the firstborn from the dead. So he's the director of the church. And then finally, in verse 19... He is the possessor of the fullness. It pleased the Father that in Him all fullness should dwell. This is the icing on the cake. The icing on the cake is that God the Father Himself said, I want Jesus, my Son, to have preeminence. In him, it pleases me that all fullness should dwell. Fullness was a buzzword. Paul used it on purpose. Because the Gnostics used it all the time. Pleroma means f they believed that God gave small doses of truth to different people and, and small doses um, of of uh, God was sort of divided up in these various emanations so that Jesus was a good start. He's the halfway house to God, but we'll show you how to have fullness, real fullness by our little rules and regulations. Paul is saying, don't need your rules and regulations. Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of God the Father, has all fullness dwelling in him. So this is Paul's intentional 
slapdown of these false teachers. Look at the last part of verse 18. Let's just close with this thought, church. That in all things, he may have the preeminence. Doesn't this make perfect sense? If he is the incarnate one, if he is God in human flesh, if as a person he perfectly reveals the Father, if he is the pre-existing one, the creator of everything in the world, and also the sustainer of everything he made, if he is the originator of the church, then what place should he have in our lives? First place, supreme. First place in our families. First place in our marriages. First place in our friendships. First place in our time management. First place on our vacations. First place in our vocations. First place in our intellectual pursuits. First place in our athletic activities. First place in what we watch on television. First place in what music we listen to. First place when no one's looking. First place. Paul says, this makes sense. He should have preeminence. Let him have first place. Always, only, Jesus. Lord, you are supreme. Jesus is supreme. And Lord, time fails. And this preacher feels like there's just so much more to say. But it is inexhaustible so much that even Paul the Apostle, I believe, had difficulty finding words even in the language he was so proficient in to adequately describe just how awesome Jesus Christ is. And so we are content as little specks on this little ball of dust in this enormous universe created by Jesus and held together by him to say as we close, Not only are you first in our lives, but we trust you to hold us together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.